Oh, it's on this side. I'm not seeing it. Oh, no, there it is. Never mind. So welcome, everyone, to the, the last session of the first day. You made it. I know it's been a very interesting day, a very exciting day. Uh, probably all a little tired and eager to get out for the uh, meet and greets. Now we're ready for this. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad everyone's ready for this. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on the LCN. Uh, my name is Adam Platt. Uh, I'm a software engineer in the IT world, which gives me a little bit of an interesting perspective on things. Uh, I'm used to working at software companies and not seeing the IT end of things, so I've learned a ton from all the IT professionals that I've had the opportunity to work with and talk to, especially at conferences like this, so I'm really happy to be able to give back a little bit and take what I'm good at, writing code all day long without breaking a sweat, and, and kind of share some of that with you and some of the things that I've learned exploring desired state configuration. Somebody else it's important for you to meet, the local configuration manager itself. This is what we're going to be focusing on. Now, I'm going to be assuming, since this is a deep dive, that everyone's familiar with the basics of DSC and all of those uh, introductory concepts. However, if you do need to fill in some of the gaps, this morning Jason Helmick had a great talk. Um, unfortunately, it's passed, but you can track down the video for that, and there's a link here for uh, the code that he released after his talk. He's also got another one on Wednesday, uh, have the details there. Uh, if you are interested in filling in on some of the details, if you're a little light on those, definitely go check those out. He's covering most of what I'm glossing over. What we're going to do today, we are going to make a very quick run through an overview of desired state configuration, just touching on some of the points that are significant from the LCM perspective, then we're going to get into the nitty gritty. So let's jump right into it. Desired state configuration lets you write code describing configurations that you then programmatically apply to another computer. And this other computer might be another Windows server, could be a workstation, could be server core, could be nano server, could even be a Linux server, and maybe someday you can even push to your toaster. We don't know. Now, desired toast configuration might be a little silly, but the point is DSC doesn't care what your endpoint is. And the reason it's able to do that is because every DSC-capable endpoint is running an LCN. That's what allows all of this to be kind of endpoint agnostic. Now, there are two ways of getting configurations onto a node. You can push your configurations to the node, or you can configure your node, point it at a configuration repository, and have it reach out on its own and pull the configurations down. Now, getting a configuration may not be the only reason that a node reaches out to another server. Configuration repositories, for sure, are one of the main reasons, uh, but there are also resource repositories that a node can use to locate and download PowerShell modules containing custom resources that it needs for its configurations. There's also the reporting server, which allows the node to report updates on its status to a central location so you can get all kinds of good info. And that's it. And I think I made it in five minutes or less. Now let's get into the heart of the LCM and what can you make this thing do. The best way that i found to explore this is to look at the different configuration options. What the LCM does is basically defined on how you configure it. So you can use the get DSC local configuration manager commandlet to get all these options, what are their current values. There are quite a few, uh, and I'm, all, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to go through some of the biggest ones that have the most impact on the behaviors. And the first ones are the timers. There are two timers on the LCM. Each one controls the firing of a separate event, and I call them you know, the refresh mode event and the configuration mode event. These timers, these settings, allow you to control how often those events fire. Now, what do those events do? The refresh mode event controls how does the LCM on this node get new configurations. It's got three possible values, push, which we expect you're going to push configurations to the node. Pull, which we're expecting you have a configuration repository somewhere, you're going to pull them down. And disable. The disabled option affects more than just the refresh mode. It keeps a copy of it cached on the machine. So it always knows what its current configuration is. The configuration mode controls what does it do with it. Again, there are three options. First is apply only. If this option, configuration gets to the node, however you're getting it there, it's always applied but then nothing. We don't look at it, we don't care what happens to it after the fact. The next is apply and monitor. In this case, in the configuration minutes, 
wakes up the LCM, and the LCM does whatever you've told it to do with its current configuration. This action has absolutely nothing to do with any server outside of your node. It's doing an internal consistency check. Another example, and this, this one we're talking about push mode. Now the most common operation that you do in DSC, in push mode especially, is you say start DSC configuration. That action actually has nothing to do with the timers. Um, it sends over and immediately applies your configuration. So I didn't animate that one on the slide. I animated the publish DSC configuration commandlet, which allows you to send a configuration to a node in a pending state. At that point, whichever timer fires, actually both of them will cause this action. The LCM will wake up, it will find that there is a new configuration in a pending state, and it will apply it. Sorry, it will apply it, step four. Um, now it's important to note that this step four isn't connected to your configuration mode. Well, you could say it is, but every configuration mode starts with apply and. So it doesn't matter how you set your configuration mode, it's getting applied once it finds out that it's there. The last example copy of that same configuration. If they do not match, we're going to pull down a new copy of the configuration, and we're going to apply it. If they do match, we're going to skip those steps. But it's important to note that the refresh mode action, um, whether it is push or pull, always ends. And if it's disabled, it doesn't apply because you're not doing anything. But if it's push or pull, the refresh mode action always ends with a consistency check, which is the same action that happens when the configuration mode timer fires. So it's almost as though the refresh mode timer is like a superset of the configuration mode. So that was a lot for just a couple of settings. But now we're going to look at a couple of other settings that are on the LCM. These three settings tell the LCM about the server-side components that it's referencing. So configuration download managers, references, where are my configuration repositories? Yeah? So the, the configuration mode timer, does that still work when it's an apply only? The configuration mode timer will fire when you are set to apply only, but it won't do anything. It basically wakes up and says, okay, I'm done, and goes back to sleep. And then last question, and then they could, uh, when it is an apply only, does it always test true if that one time it did actually apply properly? You mean the, the first time? Yeah, so in other words, it took the configuration and it applied it. Yes. Now, from then on, does it show, if you do a test on it, does it show it as true? Well, if you explicitly issue a test, it's going to invoke an actual consistency check. Oh, okay. Um, but if you just are observing the activities that are happening as the timers fire, you won't see any warning signs or any flags of anything being because if you have a bunch of different custom modules that you need to use and they're built by different business units in your organization, they can each have their own repository. You can reference them all. The LCM will figure out where the modules are that it needs. It will search them down. Um, and the report managers as well. If you've got a complex hierarchy and you want some nodes to report here, some nodes to report there, or some nodes to report to three places, you could do that. And you really don't have to think about it anymore. So at this point, I want to look at a little code. I know I'm, I'm a software engineer, I get excited about looking at code, but I try to keep it down to a minimum because sometimes I go a little code happy. Um, so how do you build a configuration for the LCM? Maybe take a step back. How do you configure the LCM? You use desired state configuration to push a special type of configuration. This is called a meta configuration. And you start. Also would like to reference, although I don't recommend, there are also two different versions of the configuration and resource repository uh, resources. So these are the web versions. There's also a share version of each of those, as you can use an SMB share for your configuration or resource repositories. Report servers must use HTTP. They don't support SMB. Another really cool thing you can do is make use of partial configurations. These you'll see applied in the meta configuration that you send to the LCM. So you'll see here, we're using this partial configuration resource to tell the LCM about all the pieces that we're going to be sending it. In this mode, in this example rather, we're using push mode. So you can use push or pull, and we'll, I'll show you pull in a second. Um, but this is an example of configuring a push mode partial configuration. In our case, we have three different pieces. Some notes about using partial configurations. Once you configure the LCM, 
to expect partial configurations. You can no longer use start DSC configuration for that normal publisher configuration to it. That configuration must be defined with configuration X. The names have to match because that's how the LCM knows what you're giving it. Otherwise, it would just be, all right, well, now I got three configurations. I don't know which one's what. To do partial configurations in pull mode, we see a little bit more complexity. We've now added this configuration ID, which is a GUID, which you know, we haven't seen a GUID this whole time, and I was so happy that we don't have to rely on GUIDs anymore, but in this scenario, you still do. Configuration ID ties all of your pieces together when you're in pull mode. The rest, pretty similar. We're using, again, the partial configuration resource, but this time, uh, and this time, because it's pull mode, we have to tell it where it's pulling from. So you have a reference, just like any other reference that you would see, uh, like if you were doing a depends on in any of your other resources, you reference the configuration repository resource that holds the configuration that you're going to be pulling. And lastly, you tell it that we're in pull mode. So, so a quick question. Sure. The grid that's on the... Um that's on the LCM. Mm -hmm. Is that the same grid that the um... different departments and they all want to they all want a shot at your nodes. You can give them their own pull servers. Have them set up their own pull servers. So you know your security team gets their pull server, and I reference that. And all the other teams get their own, and you can reference all of them separately. Pull the pieces together and apply one final configuration. One caveat to that. Oh, oh I guess I get to the caveat later. It's on this slide. I'll get to that in a second. So uh, partial configurations, we talked about push and pull, but you can also do mixed mode. So I can define a meta configuration to my LCM, and I can tell it, well, I've got a partial configuration for you. It's got four parts. This one is pull, this one is push, and these other two are pull. And it works. Um, you know, I haven't been able to think of a use case for it, but I'm sure there is one. So it's very nice that it supports it. As I said, this is great for splitting up large or overly complex configurations to make them a little more manageable. One of the things I don't care for, although I don't have a better solution, so I'm not complaining, is that you have to custom tailor your LCM configuration up front. Your LCM has to know all the pieces that are coming to it. You can't just say, all right, well, here, take this configuration, and then a fusion mode, refresh mode. They operate independently. So depending on the scenario you have, you can pick and choose only the pieces that you're really going to need in that case. That flexibility also means you can mix and match those settings to suit your need. Configuration mode and refresh mode have three options each. That's nine different choices that you can make just with those two options. That leads me to my other recommendation. There are so many permutations of ways to configure the LCM. If you come across something and you're wondering how it's going to work, build it quick in a lab, test it out. That's actually how I got a lot of the information that I needed for this talk which coming from a software engineer, it was a lot of fun trying to create a domain and install the certificate authority. Uh, yeah, that was fun. But we figured it out. We got everything and I got all the info I needed. So after what, the, what you can do with the LCM, I wanna talk a little bit about how it works. And we're gonna take a little bit of a close look at things like this. Incoming communications to the LCM. What are the requirements? What do you need to make sure you have in place so that this whole thing works. All that the LCM requires is the WinRM listeners. There's a myth that goes around a lot, and it makes sense because they're very closely connected, um, but a lot of people think you need full PowerShell remoting in order to do desired state configuration, and that is not true. All you need is the WinRM listeners. In fact, I had a few cases actually on the plane coming to the conference. I had to restore one of my nodes to a snapshot and I'm on a plane, I have no internet access, the system time is out of whack. Kerberos authentic authentication starts failing when I try and use PowerShell remoting, but I can still push DSC to it. So it's definitely a myth. All you need are those WinRM listeners. The ports that uh, the LCM is going to communicate on, the WinRM ports. You have 5985 for HTTP, 5986 for HTTPS. Now the protocols and the, the, the connectivity of it all is using this SIM protocol through HTTP or HTTPS. It's basically a, a packaged up translated version of your commands that are ready to be sent over the wire to another node. 
Now, as unfamiliar as many people may be with these two acronyms, there's another three-letter acronym that I bet everybody is familiar with. What's really interesting is that WMI is an implementation of SIM. Now, there's more to it, and I don't know all the details on this one, but I know that WMI rides on top of SIM, you know, traditionally with some extra stuff added. Um, and here's kind of the way that I like to think of it. SIM and MOF are kind of like abstract concepts. They're standards that were developed and they're maintained by a body. And WMI is a concrete implementation that makes use of those things. Richard Sidaway is giving me a face. Mm -hmm. Have I gotten it wrong? Close. Close? So, so WMI is, as you said, is Microsoft's implementation of SIM. You've got to separate out that from the new SIM commandlets and the new APIs okay. that came in with, with PowerShell 3. So, you're using SIM in two sort of separate uses? So let, let me see if I'm understanding you correctly. WMI is Microsoft's implementation of SIM. Correct. And the new SIM commandlets that were introduced in PowerShell 3 are also SIM, but they're a separate SIM implementation? Yeah. OK. Well, you heard it here. It's so it so more use, standards adherent? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they use WS Mon rather than DCOM very much. Is Microsoft's implementation of a product that uses these concepts. And another way that this analogy is helpful is that IIS isn't the only web server out. As far as port 8080 for your HTTP or HTTPS and port 445, 139, whatever SMB is, is set up to use in your environment. Um, now, 8080 is completely configurable but it's passing in all the parameters and the payload that it needs to apply this configuration. Now, this is actually the reason I was trying to track it in Fiddler. I was able to call some of the SIM methods directly by using the invoke SIM method commandlet, but I wanted to try send configuration apply, and I could not figure out for the life of me how to encode the payload, the actual MOF file. You know, I can get content on it all day long, but I was just, it's very similar, although you'll notice the actual log name is a bit different. And so what I did is I took a snippet of log entries, sorted them by time, and I used the timestamps to kind of like grab a batch out of what the LCM was doing. And I want to run through real quick what it did. So we can see DSC timer is running some method. So one of the timers fired, and it's calling this perform required configuration checks with a flag of one. Cool. It's woken up the LCM. Now we've got this job GUID which is cool, and we'll, we'll see this do it a lot because it's on every entry associated with this job. So we're doing a consistency check or a pull. Cool, yeah, because that was, that was one of the original problems I to us. But now, as we kind of climb back up that call stack, DSC timer successfully finished, and now it's making another call. We're calling perform required configuration checks again, this time with the flag set to five down the call stack, we start something, we finish something, and then the LCM shuts down. So what the heck was that? Perform required configuration checks was the method it called both times. So I pulled it up on the MSDN documentation, and I didn't get much farther. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I checked that this morning, the page still looks like that. And I'm not trying to the flag's parameter set to one is the configuration mode action. So that first longer set of log entries was when the configuration mode timer fired and we performed our configuration mode action of apply and monitor. The parameter five, which is what was used for the second one, is what is for the refresh mode action. Now, we saw in our log output that the refresh mode was set to push, which means the refresh mode action doesn't really do anything. So actually, that log is just showing us that both timers happen to fire off at the same time. Now, there are two other event logs related to DSC that can be useful if you need them. Uh, there's the analytic log and the debug log. I uh, went and I grabbed a similar snippet for this about the same timestamps, and the analytic log had two entries, and the debug log had quite a few more entries. So there's a ton of data available if you need it. The important thing to remember about these two is that they're not enabled by default. So you can use these commands to turn those logs on and start getting that output from then on. To remember about logging, again, only the operational log is enabled by default. That GUID that we saw applies to 
every unique job. And I, you know, I forgot to mention it, but the two separate uh, perform required configuration <laughs> checks calls, they each got their own separate GUID. So you can always use that GUID to tie a job to itself. Moreover, that GUID is the same across all three event logs. So if you wanted, you could have them all running, get all the win events, put them all together and sort them by time to get a really nice full and complete overview of an individual job. And lastly, and this was a suggestion for one of my coworkers, don't forget to turn off the debug log when you're done because it is pretty verbose. So let's see. I've got a little bit of time left. Do people have a lot of questions? Because if so, I can skip some of these differences and we can start doing some questions. But if you guys are good, I'll go more into these differences. Adam, it's the last session of the day. Go as long as you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to keep everybody. I know we've, we've got some, some drinking and relaxing and hanging out with everybody to do. I'll run through them. <laughs> yeah, I have an environment that runs both, so it would really help me if I. Sure. Um, so it's important to note, I'm not hitting all of these changes. Um, I just picked out some of the most significant ones, especially as it relates to affecting the LCM. Um, so some of the new or updated commandlets, we have the get DSC configuration status commandlet. This is a new commandlet, and it gives you access to the new status data that they've made available on the LCM. So this will tell you if it's idle, if it's in the middle of applying a configuration, if it's got a pending configuration, and what the... Um, results of previous configuration actions were. Next, we have, yeah. So I noticed that when I, if I do a, um, an update configuration, mm -hmm. that I can't run a test configuration until that completes. Does this command run if that's, if, if that's in process? No. Yeah, I believe it will, it will come back and tell you that the, the LCM is busy and you'll get an error. Right, so you have to wait for it to resolve. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to kill it off, I guess, you know, whatever, it's fine. I just was wondering if that worked the same or if there was a way for it to tell me something more. Don't, that's all you get, unfortunately. Um, the published DSC configuration commandlet uh, that we saw in using uh, partial configurations, that is a brand new commandlet that didn't used to exist. In the middle of applying another configuration, well, I'm about to change the configuration. I don't care what it's doing. I want to force it to stop what it's doing and change its settings now. Guess what parameter they added? Force. So you can now use the force parameter to cancel any action that the LCM is in the middle of and immediately apply your new settings. There are also some new or updated properties on the LCM itself. The first is the agent ID. This is going to come into play a lot when we're using reporting servers. The agent ID is a GUID, it's automatically generated, and you can use it to uniquely identify your node. In the past, poll server configurations used to be identified, offer basically a view of the most recent get DSC configuration status. So they'll tell you what it was up to and what the result was. The refresh mode value of disable is actually new. It didn't used to exist, it used to just be push and pull. And if you can believe it, the timers used to be required to be multiples of each other. So you'd have to have 15 and 30, 20 and 40. And I don't know the reasoning behind it, but they have adjusted that, so now that's no longer a requirement. Another difference between 4 and 5 is the way you build your meta configurations. I was saying before about when you use the DSC local configuration manager attribute, PowerShell won't let you use regular resources. In v4, you would you could, you didn't have to, but you could mix and match those resources and have a regular configuration that when you compiled it or when you, when you invoked it with your machine name and all your other parameters, it would create two MOF files. It would create the regular MOF file and a meta MOF file because you had used the LCM settings resources in there. They've really split that out. And they also added the other resources that allow you to specify your repositories and your report servers, which is much cleaner and more modular and allows you to specify multiples, which I think a lot of people are going to find themselves doing. So it's great that they built it this way. Um, and as I was saying, it gives you a better distinction from your standard configurations. So there's a little bit less confusion there. I, hint, I touched on this a little bit, talking about the agent ID. 
So in the past, DSC configurations used to require you to use a GUID for the name, or pull configurations. Um, but now, you can just use the friendly name because the agent ID has taken that place of the GUID in a sense, and the LCM will just reference the friendly name and use that to figure out where the configuration is. Because moving from a GUID to a friendly name makes things a little more transparent, they also introduced the concept of the registration key. Registration key is something that you set up on your pull server, and it is a, a secure string, generally out of the examples I've seen, people are using a GUID, um, that your nodes <coughs> must specify when they try to register with a pull server. So it's basically saying, hey, I want to go to this configuration repository, and I want to get configuration blah. The pull server is not going to let me set up into pull mode unless I give it the right registration key. This is just to provide a little bit of extra security so that people can't very easily go snooping around your pull servers to see what configurations you have and start to decipher how you configure and implement your architecture on your network. So is that, is, does that only happen? Because when you, when you set it up, it, it actually goes and connects to it right there. Yes. Which is different, right? Which is kind of cool because you get to see, wow, it's connected. Established relationship from there. Uh, I think the node's agent ID gets registered internally on the pull server, and so they're able to kind of bypass that passphrase step in the future. I didn't realize it got blanked out. I, didn't look, I never looked at it afterwards. Yeah. That makes more sense because to me, in my mind, I was thinking, well, if it's still there, then what difference does it really make? It <laughs> right. It's there for every time. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, anybody could go on and look at it and see that number, but okay. Yeah. Hopefully. In the JET database on the pull server side? Okay. Um, let's see. Partial configurations are also, they are, those are brand new in version 5. Uh, I don't have a ton to say about them. This is kind of a completely new concept. Um, but I think they're pretty cool. And again, they can help you with a lot of your large scale work. So to kind of wrap things up, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that doing a deep dive on the LCM was almost the same as doing a deep dive on DSC itself. The LCM does so much of the work. Also, make sure you know the commandlets. There's a lot available, and you can do a lot of different things with them, and they're going to help you get by very well. Also, get used to the LCM's capabilities, how you can configure it and what you can do with it. It's going to help you be more creative when you have to design solutions in different scenarios. And lastly, between v4 and v5, we know that a lot of things have changed. It's important to be aware what features are available to, available to you based on what version you're running in your environment. You know, and I, I still have environments where we're running v2, so I don't even get to use DSC a lot of the time. But it's a very important thing to keep in mind. And one other kind of, I guess it's kind of a speculation, but with all the changes that's happened just between these two versions, I would definitely expect this evolution to continue. Um, the report server, for example, is cool, but there's no actual front end for it. You have to design, you have to build the HTTP requests yourself to get the reports out of the nodes. I don't know what we're going to see come out of that, but I would bet you dollars to donuts that something is going to change. Things are going to continue to evolve, and it's only going to benefit us. We also is a link to this PowerPoint, um, and it's on OneDrive, so any updates I make to it, such as correcting my SIM story, uh, should be available immediately. Anybody have any questions? You want to move on to the lightning round? <laughs> I collected a couple of the strangest cases that I've seen, and I put them together a little bit like a game show. So I've got eight, eight quick questions. If you push a meta configuration to a pull mode node, um, pull. Uh, well, that's the configuration mode. Yeah, what's, what's that? It, that is true, um, but in this case, it, it wouldn't matter because, oh, because we're just saying it's going to apply the configuration mode action. So whatever that result is could be different, right. but that's what it would do. So the, the correct answer is B, is that if, if you tell a node to, to say, your pull mode, get a new config, until that new config is pulled by the refresh mode action, configuration mode is going to continue to look at whatever it's got locally. And whatever that action, however you've configured it, that's what's going to continue to work. Yeah, so the, the assumption is that it's in pull mode the whole time, and you just switch the configuration that it's pointed at.
So that's my bad. I'm, I'm not going to be writing uh, test questions for the SATs anytime soon. So let's... Okay, who thinks B? The correct answer is A. Um, and actually, I just learned this earlier today. Unless you use depends on in your meta configuration, that might change the, the game a little bit. But if all of your partial configurations are just out there, the node will pull whatever it can, whatever set to pull, and apply it. And eventually, when you get around to pushing the push one, then it'll apply that one too. Unless there's a merge error, which you won't know until it tries to apply it on the node. Oh, this is a great one. If your configuration mode is applying autocorrect, will the LCM send a report to the report server before or after it fixes any non-compliant resources it finds? Does it? Yes, because if it's not set to autocorrect, then it's going to report. It is, it is set to autocorrect. Auto Visibility on the drift that's happening on your nodes. So that's kind of a good thing to be aware of. Question four. Can you use start DSC configuration dash use existing to trigger a consistency check on a node's current configuration? True or false? False. Correct answer is B, false. This is kind of a trick question. The use existing flag on start DSC configuration will cause the current configuration to be applied fresh, as though it just came to the node. If your configuration mode is apply only, that's a very different thing than doing a consistency check. And you can also see in the output in the logs, in the event log, that when it does a consistency check, it is noted as a consistency check. And when it's applied fresh, it'll be noted as apply. So again, like a lot of things in DSC, they're similar but different. Question five. A node is configured for three partial configurations, one, two, and three. I'm just going to go ahead and say start DSC configuration and try to push and apply a completely separate configuration to the node. What's it going to do? <laughs> that is the right uh, line of thought. It does not let you do that. The command is going to error um, because you cannot use start DSC configuration at all with a node in, uh, with partial configurations unless you're using the use existing flag. So even if I tried to push and apply immediately one of those three partial configurations, I'd get the same error. Just a couple more. Ugh, these get more complicated, I swear. <laughs> so we have a node using partial configurations. So it's got one in pull, one in push, and another in pull. The LCM is set, refresh mode, pull. What happens if you use publish DSC configuration to send partial two to the node. Now this was a question for me because normally when you set the refresh mode of the overall LCM to pull, it won't let you do anything that's like a push or a publish. So I had to test this one out. And who do we, th do we think A? No? Who thinks B? You're all right. It will accept it and it won't say boo. Another note, partial, partial configurations are complicated, man. <laughs> They threw a lot of curveballs at me. Yeah, so if you have Jason says just to avoid it completely. Who else, who else thinks A? Anybody for B? Wow. And C? Nobody thinks C. Well, that's too bad because it's C. <laughs> Why does it change your push? It's Because I just pushed a config because I had partial configurations. Right. But if it's, if it's just one configuration and it's in pull mode, you can push to it with force and it'll swap it to push. That would have been question nine. <laughs> this is my last one. Sorry I'm keeping you guys so long, but I hope you're enjoying it a little bit. Uh, a, I did a test with it this morning. It sat there in the pending state. Now when refresh mode is set to disabled, you can't do get DSC configuration status. You, you can't get a lot of information out of the thing. Um, but once I re-enabled it, and I fired the sim method to do a refresh timer command, it took the pending configuration and applied it. So it sat there the whole time just waiting for DSC to be re-enabled. Um, those are all the questions I, uh, all the, yeah, all the questions I have for you. If there's any additional questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. If you think of any scenarios that I haven't covered and you'd like to see, I have my whole little domain environment that I'm still very proud of building um, right here on my laptop. Feel free to come find me. We'll test them out. Uh, hope you guys enjoy it.